Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webcast, how to choose the right human capital and talent management solution for your organization, sponsored by Illumity. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and can be submitted for SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have any questions during the webcast, click on the Q&A tab in your webinar controls and type them there. A new tab will open in your browser with the webcast survey. Please be sure to complete it as soon as the webcast is ended. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Illumity for the presentation. Thank you, Hester. My name is Robin Mason, and it's my privilege to partner with HR.com to present today's topic to you. Today, we are going to discuss how to choose the right HRIS and talent management solution for your organization. I'll do a quick introduction about myself, and then we'll talk about why we need an HRIS or a talent management system. I'll share some of the trends taking place in the HR and technology spaces that you may want to consider when choosing a new solution. Then we'll discuss the selection process and the steps that you should follow to ensure that you select the best possible HRIS for your organization. After that, we'll discuss additional factors beyond system functionality that you should take into account when making your selection. We'll talk about the characteristics of a good system and a great system and why a good system might just be good enough for your organization. Then I'll provide you with some tips and things that you should plan for during the selection process. And then finally, we'll wrap up by putting all the pieces together and I'll take some questions at the end as time permits. Before we jump into the presentation, I'd just like to say that whether you're delving into having an HRIS system for the first time, or you're upgrading your existing HRIS application, or perhaps you're even looking at solutions that take advantage of the latest and greatest technology, whatever the business need that has brought you here today, I welcome you and I'm hopeful that you'll obtain some value from attending today's session. So just a quick bit about me. Again, my name is Robin Mason. I have over 27 years experience implementing HR applications, primarily focused on SAP ERP human capital management, and more recently SAP success factors products. I'm based in Scottsdale, Arizona. And my passion is helping my customers to transform their HR business processes into technology solutions that allow them to focus on what really matters most, their employees. So a little bit about where I work. I work for Illumity, and we are a leading implementer of SAP solutions with over 20 years in business. And I am in the cloud products group. And we are proud to be one of only three SAP partners in North America with record, recognized expertise in all success factors categories, which include employee central, recruiting, and onboarding and talent solutions. Here are just a few of our customers, and that concludes all of the sales stuff that we will be talking about today. So let's talk about what is an HRIS system, what is a talent management system, and what is the difference between the two. Before we do that, I'd like to get an idea of who we have on the call today and where you are in your HRIS journey. So if you would please answer the following question. Is your organization considering an HRIS for the first time? Upgrading an existing HRIS application? or are you currently not in the market for an HRIS? So if you would please have a vote and let us know where you are. We'll take about 15 seconds or so. Okay, so it looks like 8% of you are considering an HRIS for the first time. 38% of you are upgrading an existing HRIS application. And 54% of you are currently not in the market for an HRIS. So perhaps you are just here for the educational credits, which is perfectly great. So welcome to you all and thank you for answering that question. 
So let's talk about the history of the HRIS. For me, and maybe for some of you, this will be a walk down memory lane. Um, these dates aren't exact, but they do reflect when these concepts became mainstream. So prior to 1985, HR was still primarily a paper-based organization. As we move into the mid to late 1980s, we're starting to automate the HR data collection, and this data was managed primarily on mainframe computers. And I remember working on these just plain black and white screens. They were very boring, but that's what we had back then. In the 1990s, we began to see a focus on user interfaces and user experience, and reporting became a priority to many organizations. By the late 1990s and early 2000s, applications that support employee growth and development became more readily available, although I'd say they were still considered to be in their infancy. In the mid 2000s, we start to see HR's role begin to change. Businesses are starting to ask HR to predict talent needs and identify gaps in knowledge and skill sets and prepare the organization to meet those needs. With the use of technology tools, HR has been shifting from being a transactional and record keeping organization to being more of a strategic partner within the company. In the last decade or so, companies have begun to recognize that their people are their most valuable asset, and there has been a significant shift towards keeping employees happy and engaged, developing their talents, and increasing their sense of belonging and overall well-being, both at work and at home, with the intention of maximizing productivity, growth, and retention rates. If we think about where we are today, and especially since COVID has hit, HR has really been called to task. They've been able to use technology as a mechanism to support remote work, modify work arrangements to keep employees safely distanced, and keep open communication lines with employees. During these recent times, HR has really needed to think outside the box. And this is where cloud-based applications, which have come onto the scene in the last decade or so, have really allowed HR organizations to be more nimble in response to their employees' needs. So what exactly is an HRIS? The short answer is that it's a software solution that manages your employee data. It could be a simple solution that tracks basic information such as national ID, date of birth, and other demographic information, or it could be something more robust that stores historical records and offers support around more advanced processes such as time tracking and benefits enrollment. A core HRIS will give some structure to your HR process with built-in rules, validations, and pick lists to ensure data integrity. Within a core HRIS, employees and managers may get to be participants in the process with employee self-service and manager self-service. And with these tools, we're moving the data maintenance closest to those who know the data best, thus taking the burden off of HR as a data processing organization. A core HRIS is generally considered to be a transactional system where we track changes such as promotions and pay changes. Most core HRIS systems support automations, for example, workflows for approval processes, calculations of fields such as rate of pay and benefits eligibility, and will also have built-in reporting capability. Companies will hold on to an HRIS for five to 10 years, so it can be considered a mid-range commitment. It's not a forever commitment. So as you embark on your selection process, you want to take into consideration what are the goals of your organization and how can the HRIS application support meeting those goals? With a talent management system, we are upping the game. Talent management introduces processes that cover the employee life cycle with the intention of finding good employees and keeping them happy and engaged by providing solutions that help us to attract, hire, develop, train, and reward them. Let's talk about the components that typically comprise a talent management system. 
with recruiting, we are attracting top talent to your organization. With onboarding, we streamline the often burdensome process of completing new hire paperwork. We also give new employees the tools and resources to feel like a part of the team and to hit the ground running on day one. Learning is not only about staying compliant, but it also provides the tools to expand employees' knowledge and skills to meet individual goals as well as organizational needs. Performance management provides a framework for ongoing communication throughout the year to set goals, provide feedback, and review the results produced by your employees. <clears throat> Ideally, employees are able to set and achieve individual goals, but also have clear visibility to how their contributions benefit the organization, both at the team and the company level. Compensation, which happens to be one of my favorite topics, is about rewarding employees for their contributions and ensuring that salaries are fair and competitive. With succession and development, we are preparing for the future by building a pipeline of qualified successors to fill key roles in the organization. For each role, we identify the knowledge and skills necessary to perform that function, and we develop the plans to prepare your high potential individuals for those roles. And finally, career planning identifies employees' interests and provides them with development opportunities and training to help them meet their goals and develop new skills to support growth into the roles that interest them. So why do we care about talent management? For one thing, turnover is really expensive. While I was researching for this presentation, I came across some interesting statistics that I thought really drive home why talent management can be a game changer for your organization. According to a 2019 Gallup article, US businesses are losing $1 trillion a year due to voluntary turnover. And no, that is not a typo. And what's kind of shocking about this is that this statistic is from two years ago, before the start of the Great Resignation, which is when people really began reassessing their lives and careers and leaving their jobs in high droves. I wouldn't be surprised if this number is even higher this year. And there's other costs of turnover as well that aren't captured in that number. For example, losing your great innovators, your dependable employees and your problem solvers, Morale and loss of key customer relationships can also come into the equation. Also in the same article, what I thought was really fascinating is that it found that 52% of employees who voluntarily terminated said that something could have been done to prevent them from leaving. And 51% of those leaving said that in the three months prior to their departure, nobody spoke to them about their job satisfaction or their future within the organization. So it seems that many of these departures can be avoided and you may be starting to see how a talent management solution can help. So we'll continue talking about that throughout the session today. All right, so I've been doing quite a bit of talking here. Let's take another poll. Um, has your organization experienced a higher than typical turnover rate in the last two years? So if you would please vote either yes, no, or if you're unsure, and we'll leave the poll up for around 15 to 20 seconds. Okay, so it looks like 52% of you have indeed experienced higher turnover rate in the last two years, 33% of you have not, and 15% of you are unsure. So that seems pretty on par with what I've seen from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, who have said that the rate of voluntary terminations this year is the highest on record since the Bureau started collecting data in the year 2000. And I understand they're calling next year 
a tsunami. There may be a, a tsunami of people leaving their jobs. So talent management is about giving managers the tools and training to have meaningful conversations with employees about their career growth and their future with the company. It involves setting goals that help the company as well as foster growth and increase satisfaction for your individuals. It also provides career paths and development plans to motivate employees and help them understand their purpose within the organization. It wasn't that long ago that when employees joined a company, they would stay for their entire career, retire after 30 years and collect their pension, and then ride off into the sunset. This was certainly the case with my parents' generation. But it's not like that anymore. Employees are looking for a path of progression. And if it's not readily available at your company, they will look elsewhere and leave. This is particularly the case with younger employees. So talent management provides a way to communicate and engage employees in their own career growth and development. The last thing that you want is for your top employees leaving the organization, thinking there was no future for them at the company, when perhaps they were identified as a key successor for multiple positions and they had no idea. So the key takeaway is that we are focused on increasing employee satisfaction and engagement. It's about providing the tools and activities to keep employees engaged and keep the organization engaged with the employees. With effective talent management strategies and processes, we're creating a win-win for both the employees and their employers. So let's talk about some of the trends in the HR and HR technology space. One of the big trends is creating digital workplace experiences that are personalized to each employee. They provide a one-stop shop to key business tools, applications, and data that employees need to perform their job with the goal of increasing productivity and engagement. Imagine a customized workspace where a manager is presented with upcoming orders and she can quickly determine if the proper staffing levels are in place to fulfill those orders. In that same workspace, she can review open service tickets and assign them to her team for resolution. And she can see how her department is performing against her annual budget. She can approve vacation requests and assign training courses to her employees, as well as set some personal goals and track her progress towards achieving those goals. All from a single portal that's tailored specifically to her as an individual. And I think the best part of all of this is that employees will stop complaining about all of the passwords that they have to remember. These digital workspaces often allow for company-wide broadcasts, as well as communication tools that foster collaboration amongst teams and departments so that they can quickly and more efficiently solve problems. These digital workplace experiences also bring together meaningful data from across the company, supporting more effective decision making. And we aren't talking about incremental changes here. It's really a new paradigm in how we think of data and its ability to drive business performance. As an example, it's a shift from what training do we need to provide in order to remain compliant with government safety regulations to the question, what is the correlation between spend on learning initiatives and company profitability or the relationship of that learning spend and the impact on reducing safety incidents? Another example of this shift is from the question, what is our turnover rate to how is our new employee retention program increasing employee satisfaction and decreasing turnover rates? Here are some of the other trends that we are seeing. Artificial intelligence and machine learning look at information about each employee, such as their job, their career path, and other topics of interest in order to provide meaningful content, such as a list of personalized learning course recommendations. Service centers provide employees with easy access to HR information, such as the company holiday calendar or benefits information. They can also submit support tickets and interact live with HR service agents. 
Diversity and inclusion are getting a lot of attention lately. And this is about bringing together different perspectives to maximize company performance, as well as create a welcoming environment in which employees of all backgrounds can be themselves and thrive both personally and professionally. Talent management solutions can provide HR with metrics and insights to help define diversity and inclusion strategies, as well as identify high potential and high performing employees to prepare them for career advancement. Technology to prevent bias in the workplace uses machine learning to flag language and job descriptions that reflect gender biases in the recruiting process to help reduce discrimination and attract a broader talent pool. Calibration tools ensure fairness when evaluating performance and compensation, as well as growth potential and, and promotion eligibility. And pulse surveys provide a means to check in on employees and see how they're doing. We don't get to see each other in the hallways as much these days. And pulse surveys allow HR to find out how we can support employees during these times of shifting work paradigms, get feedback on how any new programs are working, and gain an understanding of employees' level of satisfaction at work. So now that we've looked at how an HRIS differs from a talent management solution and how companies are addressing current HR challenges and opportunities with the use of technology, let's talk about different options when choosing your HRIS solution. It's definitely not a one size fits all and there are many offerings available in the marketplace. When we think of HR systems as platforms, we can put them into a few broad categories. One option is a standalone HRIS for tracking demographic employee data. Another option is a talent management solution that is separate from and works alongside your HRIS solution. You can typically share data between these solutions using data import and export tools or API integrations, but I would like to give one word of caution um, depending on the data transfer protocols offered by each solution, data can easily get out of sync or there could be a lag time between the systems. So you want to have a strategy in place to synchronize data between your systems if you go with this approach. A third option is an integrated solution where your HRIS and talent management data are fully integrated in a single platform and data is shared amongst the different elements of the system. With this solution, your data is considered to be real time. And this is where having a roadmap comes into play. We'll talk about this more in, a, in upcoming slides, but the roadmap will help to drive the type of solution that will best suit your needs. Perhaps you just need basic employee data tracking, in which case a standalone HRIS might be a perfect fit. Perhaps you have a core HRIS and are ready to dive into talent management for the first time, or perhaps you're looking for an HRIS solution today, but are planning to grow into talent management. Generally speaking, if your roadmap includes talent management, I recommend that you go with an integrated system. Having all of your data under a single platform is going to allow for a more timely and robust system. In the next section, we're going to have a look at the evaluation and selection process. And I just want to make clear that the same steps will apply regardless of which type of HR platform best suits your needs. So let's talk about that selection process. This can understandably be an overwhelming activity, but we're going to break it down into manageable steps that will help to ensure that you make the right choice for your organization. So this slide talks about embarking on a journey, and it really is that. It's a journey not just of implementing a new system, but also possibly transformation of your HR organization, with your first step being the selection process. This is an exciting step where you get to define what's important to you in a solution. You'll see different offerings that are available in the market, and you'll start to visualize how the various solutions will help you in achieving the vision that you've created for your organization. Once you've selected the solution that best meets your needs and complete contract negotiations, you'll begin the implementation. And this is where you'll gather your data, test the solution, perform training and change management activities, and launch the new system. 
So selecting the solution is your first step of what will hopefully be a rewarding journey. The key takeaway as we dive into these steps is that there is no one size fits all approach. There are a lot of factors that will play a part in the selection process and we'll be covering these um, later on in the presentation, but the key is to make this process work for you and your organization. The first step of the evaluation process is to form an evaluation team. And you want to make sure that you have the right people on your team. You should include business owners and stakeholders because these are the people closest to the business processes. They'll be able to clearly communicate what they need the system to do and can confirm the selected solution will meet their needs. Getting them involved from the start is likely to increase user adoption as you have their buy-in and they can help promote the new solution out to the organization. You should also include a member of your IT group, especially if you are looking at an on-premise solution where customers are responsible for activities such as obtaining, securing, and maintaining servers and performing system upgrades. But they should also be involved even if you're considering a cloud-based solution, as you may need their help with some technical aspects of the project, such as extracting data from your current system and setting up single sign-on. It's also really important to have an executive sponsor. They can provide direction and commitment to change. Their support will help drive other team members to a successful implementation. Executive sponsorship, in a sense, gives the team members permission to, to shake things up in order to drive the kinds of change that they want to see in the organization. In my experience with previous projects, without this level of executive sponsorship, Projects take longer because they're not viewed as a priority, and it can be challenging to get decisions made in a timely manner. The worst case scenario is that you end up re-implementing your old system on a new platform with little to no advantage to the organization, and that would be a very expensive and time-consuming misfortune. Lastly, you'll want to designate a team member or coordinator, a team leader or coordinator to pull together the information from each of the evaluation rounds. They'll communicate uh, with the evaluation team and vendors and schedule system demonstrations and so on. The next step is to evaluate your needs and your wants. You'll want to identify your pain points so you'll take a look at your current systems and processes and identify where there are inefficiencies, identify what is causing frustration for your users and where you're spending a lot of time coming up with patches and workarounds. Your business owners and stakeholders will likely have a lot to say about this. You want to identify which features you absolutely need to have in a new solution and what are the features that you'd like to have. You also want to work with your executive sponsors and key stakeholders to define the future state for your organization. Where do you see yourselves in the next five to 10 years? This is where you are defining your, your roadmap, which I mentioned earlier. You'll want to determine what the solution needs to be able to do to support that future state. And you may find that you need to update your list of needs and wants to incorporate that future state. Next, you'll vet the list of needs and wants with your selection team. And once completed, this will become your list of requirements, which you will share with any potential vendors. At the same time that you're defining your needs and wants, you want to go through a budgeting exercise. At a minimum, come up with a ballpark range of what you'd like to spend. You may want to break the budget into categories such as for hardware, software, and implementation cost. And also don't forget to take into consideration support and maintenance costs or other recurring fees. For example, with a cloud-based solution, there may be a monthly licensing fee. And for an on-premise solution, there may be costs to maintain hardware. The next step will be to start your research to identify systems that are well-regarded and well-rated. You'll want to talk to your peers and colleagues because they may have worked with software at previous jobs and have experience with different products for which they can share their insights. 
You may be a member of a professional organization with periodic gatherings where you can discuss other companies' experiences with various products. You can also interact here on HR.com with the many HR community groups that are available to you. And you can also perform industry research with reputable organizations such as Gartner, who periodically releases their, ma their magic quadrant for top HCM solutions. Ultimately, you want to select three to six solutions that you want to move forward with. In the next step, you're going to gather information about this, those systems that interest you, and you're going to invite those vendors to engage in your evaluation process through a request for information or RFI. We're now moving into the solicitation phase of the selection process. This process can be as formal or as informal as you'd like. You have the option to put in rigid standards that must be met in order for vendors to continue on in the selection process. And it really just depends on the scope of what you're implementing and the nature of your business. One thing that's really important is that you ask participating vendors to sign a non-disclosure agreement because you're going to start sharing information with them about your business, your processes, and your strategic vision. In your request, be sure to include relevant information about your organization, such as the number of employees and the types of employees. For example, if you have union employees or a heavy hourly base and where your employees are located. Include your list of requirements. These are your needs and wants that you identified in a previous step, along with the deadline by when they'll need to respond. Be sure to ask for information about their product features and pricing, as well as ask for a sample contract. Also ask for a list of reference customers so that you can see how similar companies have been successful with the solution. I recommend requesting references for similar sized companies within your industry. And the goal here is to receive as much information back as possible so that you can start to compare the different solutions to determine who rises to the top and who is no longer a contender. The next step is to review the information that you've received from each vendor and determine your shortlist. We started with three to six prospects approximately, and now we want to narrow down to two or three vendors. When narrowing down the list of vendors, you'll want to take into serious consideration whether the system functionality seems to meet your requirements and does the price range seem workable for your budgetary needs. From here, you'll engage further with the short list of vendors. At this point, you may be requesting addi additional information about their organization and product offerings. You may want to provide additional details that will allow them to firm up pricing and prepare a system demo for you. And we're really getting into the finite, de the finite details at this stage. Something that you'll want to do as you refine your list of vendors is to communicate with them. Let those know who you are moving forward with. And for those who have been disqualified, thank them for their participation and let them know that they will not be continuing through the process. From here, we typically move into system demonstrations and this can be done either virtually or in person. The vendor is going to present their solution by bringing you into a live environment and will highlight how their system meets your needs and requirements. I recommend that you provide vendors with a list of questions, use cases, and any industry specific requirements that you'd like to see during the system demo. And do send this to the vendors well in, in advance so that they can prepare a presentation that is tailored specifically to your organization's needs. <clears throat> you may find that you need to repeat this process Perhaps you start with your top prospects first, and depending on how those demos go, you may or may not want to move to your next tier. Or perhaps once you've gotten a feel for the systems in your top tier, you may want to take a more detailed look at the functionality. Sometimes new questions will even arise out of seeing the system demos and they may require further discussion or demonstration. 
Next, you'll want to meet with the vendor's reference customers. Some vendors will want to arrange the calls on your behalf, and others will encourage you to contact the references directly. During these calls, you want to get the customer's perspective on implementation and usage of the system, as well as any tips or things they would have liked to do differently. And you may be able to skip this step if you have internal resources in your organization who have prior experience with the product. So finally, after all of this inquiry and analysis, you'll make your selection. Which product most closely meets the most of your needs and wants with the best price point and the best customer references? Sometimes there is a clear winner and other times it's really close between two or more solutions and you'll need to make a decision based on a factor such as pricing or ongoing support. Once you identify your top choice, you'll start contract negotiations. And I wouldn't consider the selection process complete until the negotiations are finalized in case you encounter any unexpected surprises or additional costs. Make sure you get all associated project costs in writing and determine if there are additional fees and obtain estimates for auxiliary services. For example, if there's a cost for additional storage, if you run out of space, if there are any development costs involved, and is there a cost to use reporting tools or other add-ons? This will allow you to plan and budget accordingly. Once the, the negotiations are finalized, you'll want to notify all parties on your shortlist that the evaluation process is complete and whether or not they were your final selection. And that brings us to the end of the evaluation process. And that was a lot of steps. So let's just do a quick review of those. First, you'll form an evaluation team with a variety of members from across the organization. You'll identify your needs and wants and solicit key stakeholders for input. You'll identify your budget. You'll begin your research to identify three to six top contenders. Then you'll issue an RFI and gather information from each vendor. Once you've received your responses, you'll narrow down the list of vendors to your top two or three choices. Then you'll have the vendors give live demonstrations of their systems. You'll participate in reference calls or meetings with existing customers. And then you'll make your final selection and complete contract negotiations. You may find that you need to modify the sequence of steps. For example, some customers want to see high-level system demos before they compile their shortlist of vendors, and then they'll see the demos that are more tailored to their specific requirements. Others may want to create an addendum to the RFI after seeing the initial demos, as they may end up modifying their requirements based on what they've seen in the system demos. So remember that you're making a five to 10 year commitment and you want to make sure that you've covered all your bases and gotten all of your questions answered. So make sure the, make sure the process works for you and adjust where necessary. Let's talk about some additional factors to take into consideration when making your selection. While system functionality is a big consideration, there are a lot of other factors that should be taken into account as you make your way through the selection process. So let's take a closer look at some of these. The first factor is your organization size and geographical footprint. A large company will need a powerful and robust system. There will be a lot of transactions going into that system and potentially a high volume of users could be using the system at the same time. Whereas a smaller organization may not need a powerhouse system with high bandwidth. <clears throat> Another factor is where you operate. If you have a presence in multiple countries, you'll want to determine if the solution supports multiple languages, if the system supports country specific formatting, for example, for national IDs and addresses, as well as if country specific government compliance and regulatory configurations come pre-delivered with the system or whether it will be up to you to build those into the system. And also if there are any compliance reports that are included. The composition of your employee base should also be taken into consideration. 
There are some systems that are great for salaried employees who work in an office environment and have access to desktop or laptop computers. But if you have a large hourly base who aren't used to or don't have access to a computer, then you're likely not to have a large percentage of employee engagement with a solution that requires this type of equipment. On the other hand, if you have a large population of employees on the factory floor or out in the field, perhaps you have a large sales force or a number of company drivers, a solution offering rich mobile functionality might be a great choice for you. Do you have union employees with complex collective bargaining agreements? If so, you'll want to check whether the system can help automate some of these processes for you, such as tracking seniority and updating pay rates according to union agreements. The nature of your business can also have an impact. If you are a professional services company with employees who are used to accessing technology in their day-to-day -day work, they are likely to be more they're likely to more easily adapt to the introduction of self-services and may even be excited about these changes. Company culture is also a factor. If your organization embraces change and is constantly looking for ways to innovate and grow, they will probably have an easier time adapting to a new system. If your organization is a little more resistant to change, they may have a more difficult time accepting the new system, but you can of course change company culture. It might take some time, but this is where the support of your executive sponsors, as well as having a solid change management strategy in place will help. Another suggestion that I have for you is to not get bogged down by traditional mindsets of field and operational employees not using the system. Today with a mobile device in every pocket, the system is more readily accessible than ever before. We had a recent customer with a manufacturing facility in South Georgia with roughly 800 hourly employees working on a production line. When they launched their new system, they ran a special campaign and they had 96% of those employees download the mobile application and log into the system, which is pretty remarkable. So this population is definitely interested in these types of programs. You know, traditionally, when we think of development plans and career paths, we think of salaried and professional workers. But what if we now offer these to our hourly employee base, where they can log in from their mobile device and perhaps see that they have been recommended to become a supervisor and that there is a training plan in place to help them get there? as opposed to them looking for opportunities outside the company and leaving for a similar role at the competitor down the street for a dollar more per hour. So HR now has a direct line to these employees to keep them engaged. And this is definitely something that should not be overlooked. Another factor is IT resource availability. If you are a smaller organization without a large IT department, then a cloud-based solution might be a great fit for you because you don't have to worry about things like server maintenance and performing periodic system upgrades. Even companies with large IT departments are often grateful for a new system implementation where their involvement isn't as critical, where HR is able to take on many of the tasks traditionally performed by IT, such as data migration and security. Some of the other technological considerations when selecting a solution, you want to ensure the system functionality meets your business needs, not, and not just the standard delivered functionality, but also things like, does the system allow you to quickly adapt to change? Um, in these past two years, we found ourselves having to track things like health and vaccine status. And does the system provide the types of tools and is it nimble enough to support these kinds of unexpected demands? Also, do traditionally technical activities such as data migration, customization, and integration require special programming skills? Or does the, this, the, ah, does the solution offer utilities uh, to help non-technical users to build customized features and functionality? 
You also want to look at auxiliary applications that need to work in tandem with your new solution. For example, if you recently invested in a time clocking or payroll system, or if you need to integrate your data with applications such as Active Directory. <clears throat> During the selection process, make sure there is some compatibility between your existing systems and the solutions that are under consideration and determine what are the means for sharing data. For example, are there any pre-built interfaces that can be utilized? What types of files can the system accommodate? Are APIs supported, et cetera? There are two major categories of systems that I've briefly mentioned previously. We have cloud and on-premise solutions, and both have their benefits and drawbacks, and you'll likely find that your organization is a strong candidate for one or both of these types of solutions. Cloud-based solutions are commonly um, referred to as SaaS or software as a service solutions, and they are built upon the concept of predefined processes and best practice guidelines. Because of this, you are generally able to stand up the new system more quickly than a traditional on-premise implementation. However, you may be somewhat limited in your ability to customize the solution. If your company follows a model of frequent mergers and acquisitions, then this type of solution will typically allow you to scale for rapid growth. With a cloud solution, you traditionally pay a monthly subscription based on the number of user licenses, and there are no additional hardware costs. Upgrades are performed on behalf of customers, and in some cases, customers can pick and choose which new features that they'd like to take advantage of in each release. With an on-premise solution, the customer is responsible for acquiring, scaling, and maintaining hardware to support the application, as well as install periodic software updates. Hardware must be acquired and installed before the implementation can begin. Um, and this type of solution may be a good fit if you require the ability to customize the solution to support complex business requirements. But you should plan to have IT resources readily available to provide development and ongoing maintenance and support. So this is a key decision that you'll need to make. Do you want to have complete control over the hardware and software in-house? And are you willing to put, uh, to put forth the expenses and resources to maintain an on-premise solution? Or are you comfortable with putting your resources into a cloud-based environment and having the solution provider managing these aspects for you? So you may want to also have a look at whether the solution can easily keep up as your organization changes and grows. Does the solution allow you to quickly and easily add large numbers of employees to the system? And are new employees easily able to access the system? Are you able to enhance system configuration and settings with internal resources? Or does it require the help of an implementation partner or the software vendor? And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about security. Data privacy should be of utmost priority in your selection process because you want to have a safe and secure solution that protects your employees' sensitive data. Data access should only be granted to those who need it in order to perform their job. And the system should have the ability to restrict data access based on role. So for example, a manager and a person in HR will have very different needs for the types of data that they'll need to view and edit. And the system should be able to accommodate for this easily. You should have the ability to run data privacy reports and audits to see who has been accessing and updating which employee data. And in recent years, with the introduction of GDPR data protection laws, if you have any European locations, you want to look at whether the solution provider has data centers that operate in those regions, as well as whether they offer products and processes that support GDPR compliance. You'll also want to consider how easy it is to use the new system. Is it intuitive? Will it require an extensive amount of training and change management? You want to ask if end user training materials are included with the system or if it's up to you as the customer to develop those. 
Is any administrative training provided with the product or must this be purchased separately? And what support resources are, are available to you during the implementation as well as once you are live with the new system? Earlier, we talked about setting a budget and getting a ballpark figure. You want to make sure that you communicate this number to your selection committee as well as any software vendors who are under consideration. Make sure that vendors are giving you all of the costs involved. For example, if there's any additional licensing costs or setup fees or annual maintenance fees that are not included in the licensing. Is there a charge to take advantage of new functionality as it's released or is it included in your existing licensing fees? And are things such as data extraction and reporting considered to be add-ons or are they included? I've actually worked on a few projects where customers were unable to create reports or extract their own data from their current HR systems. And um, you know, what we found is that some vendors will even charge additional fees for these services. And there can be a, a bit of a lag um, in the turnaround time to produce these for their customers. Um, some customers will even charge for things like adding a new cost center or a department code. So you want to make sure that you're asking these questions during your selection process so that you aren't caught by surprise by any unexpected fees or lag times. Another consideration is whether the solution is modular. Are they trying to sell you the full suite and are you paying for more than what you need? Or can you purchase only those modules that you need? And can you add additional modules in the future? Okay, so let's talk about the characteristics of a good and a great system. So no system will ever do everything that you need it to. <clears throat> that perfect system simply doesn't exist. As you go through the selection process, you'll want to keep your list of needs and wants at the forefront of your mind. And don't get distracted by all the bells and whistles that you see in your system demos. Ideally, you want to find a system that meets all or most of your needs and many of your wants. You're going to find systems that have great characteristics and good characteristics, and you don't necessarily need to go with the system with all of the great characteristics if the system with the good ones meets your business needs, especially as you take your budget and resource availability into consideration. So when we think of the characteristics of a good HRIS system, it will meet the complexity and needs of your organization on a day-to-day -day basis. It will have good reporting capabilities to get usable and useful information out of the system. And it should address some of your wants and most of your needs and also fit within your budget. Some of the features that you can expect from a good system are the ability to store all of your relevant personal job and pay related information about your employees. And it should be able to handle leave requests and basic absence tracking. A great solution most likely will have integrated functionality between core HR and talent management. And we're shifting from a transactional system to a strategic system, which allows HR to play a more strategic role in the organization. It should inc incorporate mobile functionality and contain self-service functionality with customizable workflows for approvals and notifications. It should also offer onboarding to streamline new hire paperwork and provide helpful resources to your new employees. It also contains fully integrated talent management, which allows you to do performance reviews, perform career and succession planning, and to put training plans in place to develop your employees. A great solution will allow you to focus on growing your employees, retaining them, and increasing overall employee satisfaction. So I'd like to leave you with a few final tips as you embark on this journey. First, only buy what you need. Don't fall into the freebies that the vendor is offering to throw in because trust me, nothing is free and you're paying for it one way or another. You want to look for a modular system where you can buy only what you need right now and which allows you to bring in additional functionality when you are ready for it. Consider the ongoing support of the application. What happens once you are alive? Ask what support resources are offered by the vendor and how do you go about utilizing them? 
And as well, are there any additional fees for this support? Most likely you will need to be able to get data in and out of your new system. So make sure that you understand what tools and resources are available with the product and that they will meet your needs and are compatible with your existing systems. You may want to ask if there are libraries of pre-delivered integrations that come with the solution, as many products today do offer those. And now let's wrap up. So in summary, um, as you embark on this journey, you want to form a good team. Don't try to do this on your own. Engage your key business users and key stakeholders. These are the ones who know the business and the current pain points, and they need to be happy with the solution. Their buy-in will help with the adoption of the new system. Spend some time envisioning your future state. Engage your executive sponsors in defining this future state and enlist their support to bring it to fruition. Do your research, talk to your peers and colleagues and reference trusted industry resources when choosing your contenders. Go through the selection process and make it iterative if necessary. If you aren't getting the information you need, add steps to the process to ensure you're making an informed decision. Take into account your organizational size and ge geographic footprint. If you absolutely love the look of a system, but they only support North American operations and your company operates in two di uh, 10 different countries and three regions, the system's never going to be a good fit for you. Evaluate system features and be realistic about your expectations for your new system. You probably will not find a system that can do absolutely everything you need it to, but try not to sacrifice on your needs and get as many of your wants in as you can. And finally, look at both good and great offerings and figure out where you fit on that spectrum. Is good good enough for your organization and its immediate and midterm needs? Or are we moving towards a great system with full integration and transformation of your HR business processes. So I did not leave a lot of time for us to have questions. So um, if we didn't get all of your questions answered today, or if we didn't cover anything that you'd like to know more about, let us know if you'd like to hear from us after today's session. So if you vote yes, I or a member of the Illumity Cloud Solutions team will reach out to you. And we're happy to help with your selection process, as well as talk to you about how SAP Success Factors products can help you. So I'll just give you a moment to vote. Let us know. Okay, great, thank you. So that concludes today's presentation. I'd like to thank you for your participation. It was truly a privilege to be with you all today. Um, my contact information is listed on the slide. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions that we didn't get to today. Um, also just a reminder, if you would please um, answer the final evaluation survey. And Hester, I'm not sure if we have time for a quick question. I did a lot of talking today. Unfortunately, no, we don't really have time. Okay. So again, thank you everyone for your participation today. And Hester, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. It looks like we have just a moment left. Again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if there's anything that we can do to assist. Thank you. I'd like to thank our presenter as well as all of you for joining us today. If you'd like to view this webcast again, the archive recording will be available on the hr.com website within 24 hours. 
The webcast credit will show in your HR.com account within two business days, and we'll also send you an email with your credit information. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that opened in a new browser page on your computer. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.